Good afternoon. My name is Larry Mamiya, and I want to welcome everyone to the Martin Marty Forum, sponsored by the Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion of the AAR. The committee chose Professor James Cohn as this year's recipient for the Marty Award. Awarded annually since 1996, the Martin E. Marty Award recognizes outstanding contributions to the public understanding of religion. The award goes to those whose work has a relevance and eloquence that speaks not just to scholars, but to the broader public as well, and whose work is known through a variety of media. Nominations forms, and these are the green nominations form, will be placed in the, uh, by, the, by the back door there uh, at the entrance so that uh, if you want to nominate someone for next year's award, you can pick up a form and fill it out. Thank you. James H. Cohn is a premier theologian who has educated scholars and the public about the importance of the theological reflections of oppressed black people. He has mentored two generations of doctoral and graduate students. As a creator of the tradition of black liberation theology in the United States, he has participated in numerous international conferences focused on comparative liberation theologies in Africa and South Africa, Asia and Latin America. He has appeared as a major commentator in the Black Side series on This Far by Faith focusing on the role of religion in African-American communities, past and present. Cohn and his work have been featured by Bill Moyers' journal on PBS. In 1992, Ebony Magazine awarded him the American Black Achievement Award in the category of religion. With its focus on religion and social transformation and a critique of racism, Cohn's black liberation theology has been controversial, often accused of reverse racism, racism by some critics. He has patiently responded to the controversy in numerous newspapers, newspaper interviews, most recently, recently during Barack Obama's public dis disagreement with his pastor, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Cohn is the Charles A. Briggs Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. He is the author of 11 books with translations in eight languages and more than 150 articles. He is best known for his groundbreaking works, Black Theology and Black Power, which just celebrated its 40th anniversary, A Black Theology of Liberation, The Spiritual and the Blues, God of the Oppressed, and Martin and Malcolm, A Dream or a Nightmare. He is currently working on the cross and the lynching tree. As in past years, the format of the Marty Forum is to have an interview and conversation with the awardee about his work. Jim Cohn will be interviewed by Cornell West, who is a former recipient of the Marty, Martin Marty Award and a class of 1943 university professor in the Center for African American Studies at Princeton University. After the interview, which will last about 45 to 50 minutes, we will open the conversation to questions and comments from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, my dear brother, Larry Mamiya. Superb scholar in his own right. Let me begin by saying that I am so blessed and delighted. I'm privileged. I'm honored to be sitting next to not just my dear brother, not just my beloved colleague, but one of the towering figures in contemporary Christendom, one of the grand figures in not just American life, but life that focuses on structures of meaning tied to the gospel with implications for other religious traditions as well. I was blessed to be a colleague 
with my dear brother, Professor James Cone. We taught for six years together, black theology and, and Marxist thought. And the fact that we are here to pay tribute to someone who single-handedly initiated a new paradigm in theological discourse in the latter part of the 20th century. Do you all know how rare that is? How rare that is. Two texts of liberation theology before our dear brother Gustavo Gutierrez produced his classic. It began right in North America. I won't say USA because we are in Canada. And we love our Canadian brothers and sisters. But I cannot begin to convey my excitement uh, for our dialogue. Now, you all may not know, but my dear brother, this towering figure, was born in Gut Bucket, Jim Crow, Arkansas, in the middle of the Depression. And he's ascended to the highest heights theology and the academy and seminary and university. And we know that, of course, no matter how high you ascend, we all are our mother's child and our daddy's kid. So my first question has to do with Lucy and Charlie Cohn. Tell us about your parents and the impact that they had on a brilliant little precocious Negro named James <laughs> in Bearden, Arkansas. Well, let me begin by saying how deeply pleased I am to receive this award, especially by the American Academy of Religion. I will say more about that tonight, but now I just want to try to say something in this context about why I wrote what I wrote. But I also want to say to you how pleased I am to be on the stage with Cornel West, my dear friend and colleague, and with Larry Mamia, who has strongly supported me throughout the time that I have been writing about a black liberation theology. And I want to thank all of you who have come to this session. Now let me just say a word about Lucy and Charlie Cohn. I would not be here if it were not for Lucy and Charlie Cohn. My daddy finished the sixth grade and my mother the ninth grade. And I was raised in Bearden, Arkansas, a town of about 1,200 people, 400 of whom were black. It was in the 1930s when I came into the world, when Lucy and Charlie brought me into the world. But I think they, more than any other two people, have influenced me and gave me the strength to be sitting where I am today. Their love, their belief in me, their self-confidence in me, and in my two brothers, sustained us through the times of Jim Crow in Arkansas. And all I know is, is that while I realized that the world did not love me, my parents did. And the community where I grew up loved me deeply. And that love is what gave me the strength to say what I thought the Christian gospel was and is in the context of the United States of America and the world. So it's Lucy and Charlie who gone to glory now, but who's looking down smiling. I am quite sure that their son is now sitting before you talking about them and what they did to make it possible for me to sit before you and talk about the meaning of the Christian faith for the troubled times in which we live. Yes, indeed. Lucy in Macedonia, AME Church, and Charlie 
not always attending voluntarily. Is that right? He wasn't too crazy about it. Is that right, brother? That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> because, I mean, there's something about Charlie Coney. I, I was blessed to meet your mother. You remember we met in yes, there? I do. She I was do. a gem and a jewel and was on fire in ways that I can see it transmitted and bequeath to you and your brother Cecil. But, but Charlie's run out of town. There's an attempt to lynch him. He refuses to work in any of the factories. He refuses to have his beloved wife work as a domestic maid. He was what in those days we call a bad or crazy Negro, which is to say courageous in the face of American terrorism, because Jim and Jane Crow was a species of American terrorism. What was it that gave him this kind of courage? And we can begin to see it at work within the young James Cone on the way to becoming the grand figure that you are today. My daddy set the example, although I was a mother's child. That is, I was always with my mother, and my older brothers were always with my father. So I never experienced quite the discipline that my older brothers experienced in the hands of my father. Discipline as in tough love. Yes, discipline ah. as in tough love. <laughs> All right. But my mother loved me dearly, and my father set the example. I guess what you might say, the example that he set is what I wanted to be. I wished always that I could have his courage, have his intelligence, and be able to sustain myself no matter what I faced. One of the most important things that happened to me when I was growing up as a child is that I was never afraid because of my mother and father. I always felt that no matter what happened around in the society, my daddy would always be there to protect me. And he was that. So I wanted to emulate, I wanted to imitate his courage, his style. He was one person who could, if he were the only one standing, if he thought it was right, he would stand. And my mother had difficulty with that because she was concerned about his life most of the time. But my father, he always said, truth is truth no matter who tells it. And he believed that deeply, even though he had only finished the sixth grade. But for me, he was always the model. I felt there was nobody smarter, more intelligent, and could do as much as my father could. And so he set the example that I wanted to be like. I wanted to be as courageous. I wanted to be as disciplined. I wanted to be as dependable as he was. He was always on time. He was always there when I needed him. And if he ever gave his word, you could always count, of it, count on it. And that's why he always said, my word is my bond. Oh, he's definitely smiling now, though, brother. He's definitely smiling now. And it's on to Shorter and Philander Smith and then Garrett Biblical Institute, more well known today as Garrett Theological Seminary. What was it about those educational institutions that would shape one of the most powerful theological minds of late modernity? Well, there were eight people in my graduating class in high school. Eight. Eight Negroes? Eight Negroes. Lord have mercy. And I graduated in 1954. And that was the year of the Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation in public schools. I, it happened about two weeks before our school had turned out. And I wanted to go the next day. But my mother said, no, you wait. It's not safe yet. 
But I left and graduated from high school at uh, Washita County Training School in Bearden, Arkansas. And that was the school for Negroes at that time. The white school was called Bearden High School. But the black school was called Washita County Training School. It was, it was not, I didn't get all of the technical education, therefore I could not go to a top-notch school. So I had to go to Shorter College, that's an AME school, a junior college. And I went there, and there again I was loved, deeply loved. I didn't learn a whole lot. <laughs> And it, it was, but it, you it, know, was, it was unaccredited. Too, yeah, wasn't? yeah. But see, if I had a choice between being the smartest and being loved, mm, mm. I choose love any day. Yes, yes, yes. And love that that sense that you can be what you want to be. I received that at home in my mother's and father's family. I received it in my high school and I received it at Macedonia AME Church where I grew up, where I first learned to stand up at Easter and give a speech. That's where the self-confidence came. That's where I learned to believe in myself. I was 16 when I went to college, 15 when I graduated from high school, but my birthday came August 5. So by the time I got to Shorter, I was 16 and looked like I was 10. <laughs> and that first year was difficult because it was hard to get a girlfriend when you're 15 <laughs> and you look like you're 10. <laughs> and I, you know, my brothers would look older and they had no trouble, but I had to wait a year. Uh, so I could get a little older. But what I learned at Shorter was not so much technical knowledge, but I learned how to love and I learned how to receive love. And it was the transition for me to go to a higher level of knowledge, which was at Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was a little better academically, there were 500 students there, about 150 at Shorter. So I was moving up from Shorter to Philander. And there I learned a little more. There I met teachers who had PhD degrees. And I remember asking one of my teachers, how long does it take to get a PhD? And uh, he said, well, I don't think you might need to worry about that. <laughs> I said, no, I want to know. He said, well, the route you're going, it would take you at least three years at a Bachelor of Divinity degree and at least three or four years after that. I said, well, with that, I think I can have a PhD by the time I'm 25 or 26. And he looked at me. He said, that'll be the day. And I took that as a challenge. I took it as a challenge. When people say I can't do something, that's when all of the self-confidence, all the love empowers one to go, keep on going even though the way is difficult. So Philander Smith College hmm. was another place, black school, African-American school, where I had teachers and I had classmates in which we believed in ourselves. Uh, we may not have been the smartest in the world, but we didn't know we weren't. So we thought we were, we were doing pretty good. So I finished magna cum laude from, from Philander Smith, and I thought I was ready for Garrett Biblical Institute. That's what it was called then in 1958 when I went there. And my first quarter there, I almost failed. I made three C's, and my professors told me that they were being gracious, and they were being nice, and that's when I realized. I went back, got me a ninth grade English text, and I said, I got to learn to write. I picked up James Baldwin, hmm. 
Hmm. And I said, I want it. He only finished high school, so if he only finished high school, I ought to be able to do that too. And I picked up his writings, along with Richard Wright, along with Ralph Ellison, and that's when I began to try to figure out how do I find my voice hmm. in all of this theological stuff that I'm faced with. I decided I want to be a theologian. And so I wanted the baddest theologian I could find. And that's why I chose Carl Barth. I chose Barth because of the impressive nature of those dogmatics. I said, if I could wrestle with them and come out, maybe with a limp, <laughs> but I, if I could come through it, I might be able to make it. Still, I was, all the time I was in seminary, I still did not, you know, read one book by a black person at Garrett. But I had the idea that if I ever would find my voice, I would have to go back into the history and the culture of the people who enabled me to speak in the first place. And that's when I started reading, but I couldn't write about that at Garrett. Because if I wrote about that at Garrett, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> so I did the traditional thing, not all that well, although I made A's and all of that. But I knew the writing did not touch, did not do what I wanted to do. And I knew that no matter how good I, got, I, I was, at trying to understand Bart, and I was pretty good at that, that that would always be limited to me. I was not Swiss. I was not European. I had to go back to the point of my origin and then talk to Bart. I just can't talk to him on his own terms. I was re realizing that all the while I was in graduate school, but I didn't have a space in which to say that or to write that. So I went on, I got my degree, and finished Garrett in the spring of 1965. You were the first African American to get your PhD there, right? I was the first at Garrett at and Garrett. Northwestern, that joint PhD yeah. that they offer there. Yeah. I was the first African American to get that degree. There was one other person in school with me who was the second one, Oswell Bronson, who was the president of ITC and then Thune Cookman. He and I were classmates. He finished one year behind me. Mm. Mm. I want to ask a question about this tension now between the different vocations. Because on the one hand, you are pastoring three churches between 16 years old and 19 years old. On the other hand, even at Garrett, you're working as janitor and painter because the money's not flowing from Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to choose between being a pastor because you had initially planned, as I recall, to go return to Arkansas and head a church. What is it about this calling that begins to tilt you toward the ministry in the form of being a theologian as opposed to ministry in the form of pastoring? That's a very good question. I started pastoring my second year of uh, college. Mm -hmm. I received the call to the ministry December 12, 1954. My first, 19, yes, 1954. That's when I uh, went off to short of college. And by December, after I had gone there in September, I went into the ministry. And by the next year, I had a small church of about 12 members, Sand Hill AME Church. Hmm. And that's where I pastored. I was going to be a pastor. That was what I wanted. And I went from Sand Hill to Allen Chapel and to Spring Hill AME Churches. I pastored for three years in college. And there again is where I was loved. Here were elderly men and women who treated a young 17, 18 year old boy as if he were the pastor, as if he were a man, a full adult. And that empowered me, the respect that they gave to me. 
and how they nurtured me into working with people, that deepened my commitment to the ministry. So I went off to Garrett with every intention of coming back to Arkansas and pastoring. But in the process of my doing the Master of Divinity at Garrett, uh, the AME Church was not so friendly about me being in school. Uh, and so they did, and I wasn't very good at uh, 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 being as different in relation to the hierarchy as they liked. Uh, my brother was much better at that than me. So I got marginalized by the AME church, and I had to figure out what I was going to do if they did not give me a church when I got out of Garrett. And at the same time, I was caught by this spirit of intellectual imagination in theology. Hmm. I got caught about asking the question, what precisely is the Christian faith for our time and for our place? I saw Bart wrestling with that in his time and place. Hmm. I saw Bonhoeffer wrestling with that in his time. I saw Niebuhr wrestling with that. I said, where are the wrestlers with the defining the faith in my community? We seem to think that white people already understood what the gospel was. Mm. And they just didn't apply it right. Mm. How can you have a correct understanding and not live it? How can you have a correct understanding of the gospel and yet, live in a way that contradicts the understanding that you say. I know there's going to be a gap. But the gap was so great that it could not be missed. And that made me, I, and not only that, the civil rights movement was in its heyday. Mm, mm. There was not one word said by my professors at Garrett about it. Not one word about it in the theological text that I read. Hmm. And that made me angry. I said, how can you understand the gospel in the 1960s as blacks are struggling for their freedom and there is not one theologian who engages it head on in a sustained theological way? <clears throat> that was my question. And that just inspired me to want to be somebody who said something about that. I wanted to be a theologian because of the gap that I experienced in seminary. And I remember feeling that so deeply inside me, but not having the words to say it. Not having the authority to say it. And I just kept saying, one day, I'm going to be able to say it. All I have to do is work and work and work and work. And if I work hard enough, long enough, I will acquire the skills to be able to articulate what I know to be true inside me. That was the point that made me wanted to do theology. I, I almost went into New Testament. I almost, because Greek was, was really attracted to me, I, I love the New Testament. I almost, went, I said, but that's a little bit too technical for me right now. <laughs> I got to be able to speak, not to what Paul said. I want to know what, what needs to be said now. Mm. That's what sent me to theology, not into New Testament. And I have no regrets about that, so I still, you know, read it, New Testament. I still read it. I still read it. And, but it is this challenge to speak to your times about what the heart of this gospel is all about. That's what spurred me to go into theology. And then here comes Grace. Here comes two enabling figures. There's a white brother named Professor William Horndon, and there's another black towering figure named C. Eric Lincoln. 
and, and you were wrestling with this classic piece of Christianity and black power, a classic that was rejected by the Christian century, rejected by motive. But what was it about Professor William Horndon in your trajectory? What was it about C. Eric Lincoln that allowed your voice to come forth? Those are the two most important people in my intellectual life. Hmm. William Horton, Canadian from Saskatchewan. He was my, one of my theology professors. He was, without question, one of the first white men I met who treated me like a human being and who argued with me not as if I were a black person, but as if, as if I was a human being. And he, more than anybody else, hmm. told me that I could think. Because I remember when he, if he had not asked me the question, you are going to go on and get the PhD, aren't you? And I said, I, hadn't, I didn't know that I could do it. He said, you can do it if anybody I have ever taught can do it, you can. So he gave me that self-confidence. He was a scholar of Karl Barth. And that's one of the reasons why I went that way because he loved Barth so much. Now, Horton didn't talk much about race, but when he spoke in chapel, he spoke about it. But it didn't come into his teaching so much of theology. But he was not resistant to it when I started writing about it when I got out. But Hardarn gave me the confidence at Garrett that just maybe I had the intellectual capability of being a doctoral student. And that's important. When you got an advisor that believes in you, I remember when I applied for the PhD program, the person in that office who was a professor at Christian Ethics at Garrett at that time, don't look it up. God bless him to be with him. <laughs> he told, when I walked in there and asked for an application for the doctorate program, he said, what for? Hmm. I said, I want to apply and get a PhD program. He said, there's no need for you to apply. You're not going to get in. You're wasting your time. I said, oh. So I walked out and I went back to Hordern. And I said, Professor Hordern, uh, the person whose name I won't call, uh, told me that not to apply. He said, if they don't accept you into that program, I will quit. Wow. 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 And he told me to go back. Fill it out. Submit it. And Horton meant that. And I got accepted. But not only did I get accepted, Horton encouraged me. He challenged me. He made me rise to the highest intellectual heights that I could at that time. Now, Eric Lincoln, I don't think I would have published anything without Lincoln. Hmm. Now let me just tell you about Eric Lincoln. Yes, yes. I wrote my first essay called Christianity and Black Power in 1967. I met Eric Lincoln in February of 1968, uh, 67, one of those years. But I met Eric Lincoln shortly after I wrote that essay. And a friend of mine said, who knew Eric Lincoln, I had never met him. Eric Lincoln didn't know about me. A friend of mine who went to school with Lincoln said, why don't you let Lincoln see the essay? And I remember we were at a conference, Black Methodist for Church Renewal in Cincinnati. I think mm. it was in February of either 68 or 67. I think it was 67. But anyway, Lincoln read it, came back to me, and we talked all night about it. Mm. Mm. And he encouraged me. Yes, yes. 
And he set up situations for me to go and print, present that lecture. One was at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, Colgate uh, 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 in Rochester, New York. That was my first kind of public appearance. Hmm. Then I told Lincoln, I'm going to write a book on this Christianity and black power. He said, go ahead. And he told me how good I could write and how insightful of what I was saying. I wrote Black Theology and Black Power in June of 1968, just after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And you're talking about holy anger. Mm, I was mad as hell. And all, I poured it all into black theology and black power. I'd only met Lincoln once. I said, what am I going to do with this? I wrote it in one, one moment, just one flush, working from about 7 in the morning to about 11 at night. Hmm. And in about five weeks, it was done. And I, I didn't know what to do with it. I, I, I didn't know. I had no idea how you get anything published. So I sent it to Lincoln. And in less than a week, Lincoln called me in Adrian, Michigan, where I was teaching. And he said, James Cone, what have you done here? Can I get this published for you? I said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. And he got C. Bear Press, who had published his, Is Anybody Listening to Black America? And Eric, at the same time, asked me, could he publish my essay, Christianity yeah. and Black Power? And I said, yes. And he put it as the first essay in his book, Is Anybody Listening? to black America. And Seabury accepted my publication and it was published in March of 1969. Eric Lincoln not only got the first book published, time I finished that book, he said, Jim, you gotta write another one. I said, wait, hold, wait a minute. I said, I gotta take this thing slow. He said, no, I'm editing the C. Eric Lincoln uh, studies in black religion, and I want yours to be the first volume. I gotta have it. And I didn't stop. I sat down, I was teaching at Adrian, and I was writing. Well, the last two chapters in Black Theology and Black Power was just a taste of what I was working with. And I had it, I wanted to do it, but I didn't know that I had that much, I uh, didn't know I was going to do it right away. And it was Eric said, no, you got to do it. This is too important. So Eric published my first and second book. He not only did that, hmm. when I was teaching at Adrian, he said, Jim, I said, yes. He said, you should be at Union. I said, what? Union Theological Seminary? Oh, I didn't go there because I didn't think I was smart enough. He said, yeah, you should be here. He said, John Bennett is going to be calling you soon and inviting you to come up there and, and, and talk to the faculty. And soon John Bennett called me. Eric was teaching at Union. And I got an interview at Union in January of 1969. And I met all the faculties whose books I had been reading. John McQuarrie, mm -hmm. Daniel Day Williams, Paul Lehman, Roger Shin, all these people who I revered. I said, oh no, up in the mix of this. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't doubting what I was saying. Oh no, I never doubted that. Huh? I just didn't know whether I had, I belong in all of this intellectual stuff that's going on up here. Oh, I, did, I had never had a doubt about what was burning inside me. Mm. I just, you know, I just, I don't know whether they're going to take this too good. 
of their union. You know, it's one thing to hang on the corner and say it. <laughs> but it's another thing to say it in the halls of academia, one of the most well-known divinity of schools or seminaries in the world where Niebuhr and Killick talk. I remember when I first walked up there, my first night there, I didn't sleep, couldn't sleep. Because of all of the significance of the intellectual life that had gone on and was going on at that place. Did I belong there? I knew I was right about what I was saying. That's one thing. But did you have the intellectual discipline to sustain yourself in the midst of such high caliber intellectual theological discourse? And I called William Hardern, who had graduated from Union. He called me, and I, he called me up, and I called him. I said, Bill, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think I should go? I was not sure. I was sure about what I was saying. But I wasn't sure that I should go there and try to sustain it. And it was Lincoln and William Hardern who had no doubt in their mind that this is where I belong. So I wouldn't be at Union Seminary if it had not been for William Hordern and Eric Lincoln. And I certainly wouldn't be sitting on this stage today. Mm. Boy, that's powerful though, brother. That's powerful. Thank God for James Lacona. Thank God for... William Horndon, and thank God for Sierra Lincoln, and thank God for our beloved Union Theological Seminary, I tell you. I recall when your book came out, brother, we would debate your book in front of the Black Panther Party headquarters. And I was the only Christian element, not even a body, hardly, <laughs> working with the party. And I don't have words to convey how it didn't just enhance and enrich my life and my, my, my witness, but it rescued me because it allowed the black radicals to recognize it was not just an intervention, but there was a rich history that fed into their righteous indignation at what was going on. And of course, what I always accented that what you had and our challenge then was not just a talk about the poor, but a genuine love and celebration of poor people as human beings who warrant our attention. Echoes of Isaiah 1, echoes of the fifth chapter of Amos, echoes of the 25th chapter of Matthew. So in that sense, your work really just created a whole wave of our younger brothers and sisters like myself in terms of providing such a uh, orientation and a new framework in those times because the blood was flowing on the streets. Yes, it was. The blood was flowing on the streets. Now, could you tell us now then, um, once you get to Union and you're beginning to generate these tombs, because it took a while to read that second book, I must say. That <laughs> first book we read quickly and reread. The language was just so crisp and clear and concise, filled with that prophetic energy. That second book was more systematic. I remember when I read that and I was in high school, I said, he's still on fire, but the temperature is lower in the mode of expression. <laughs> <laughs> did, 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 did you experience that shift? I mean, what, what, what was going on there? Was that? Let me say a word about that. <laughs> Now, I think, I think the audiences were different. I, I got you. I got you. In Black Theology, Black Power, I was writing for the movement. That's why the first chapter is on Black Power. And that's why when you read the last two or three chapters, last two chapters in there, it's, it's more about the black consciousness movement. Mm -hmm the Panthers and black power and all of that. I'm trying to show 
That's what's happening in the, the black community. They have no apologies to make. So I am, I am, I am, the language of it is coming from the street. But when I move to a black theology liberation, I am writing to white theologians, black theologians, but particularly white theologians. Because mm. I'm mad at, I'm mad at in the second book than I was in the first. It's just that the only people who experience that anger are people working in theology. Because I'm working with what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. See, in, in black theology, black power, I'm trying to encourage a black freedom movement that what they are doing is actually an expression of the highest divine work in this world. And I'm trying to help us see it in secular expressions. I'm trying to help us see it in the, in the very people who don't think of themselves as Christians. But in Black Theology Liberation, I want to write to the Christians. I want to write to the white Christian church, to white theologian, black theologian, to anybody who claims their identity with the Christian gospel. And in Black Theology Liberation, I just want to shape an understanding of the gospel that places the liberation of the poor and the weak at the heart. And anybody who does not address that cannot claim to have a Christian gospel. It may be some other kind of gospel, but it's not the Christian gospel. And so mm. there is where I'm pressing that. Mm. Mm. And it is, it is, I'm using a language that theologians can understand, a language that preachers can understand, a language that Christians feel comfortable with. And I want to, I want to, I want to say it as sharp and as direct as I can. That was the book. Black theology liberation is the one that most theologians have the most difficult with. Uh, not black theology and black not power. Not the first one, not the first one. So not the first one. Yeah. So, uh, I, so there's a little thing. People are always saying, did, you, did, you, uh, did, you, did some of the anger soften? No, they never softened in 40 years. I'm still feeling it. <laughs> I'm still feeling it. I thank everybody for this award, but I'm still feeling it. No, but I, I think one of the reasons why you're getting the award is because you have been a long distance runner. You've been a marathoner when it comes to expressing <laughs> holy anger in highly sophisticated theological discourse with a high quality critical intelligence and combative imagination, but also tied to bearing witness on the ground with the least of these. And that's what makes you so unique. I recall the debates we had in Professor Preston Williams' class. Professor Professor Williamson right there on about the ninth row there. Just wave, just wave, just wave, brother. Give him a hand, give him a hand. Harvard professor, first black brother tenured at Harvard Divinity School. And he used to have us read your classics, but also Charles Long, and also Cecil Cone, and also Deodis Roberts, and others. Well, is Professor Cohn actually presupposing European models in his critique of European thought? Yeah. Is Professor Cohn too Christian? Why is he so in love with this first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus? What, 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 what's going on here? Tell us just something about it. And William Jones. Oh, oh we got to yeah, mention yeah. William Jones. It's God of white races. Oh, another classic. They were coming at you, brother. Yes, they were. <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> I felt under siege. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. And um, I, I just try to remind myself what I was trying to do. One is I was not trying to say the last word on anything as I said yesterday. I was not. I was not trying to give a balanced interpretation of what black religion is all about. I was, I was intentionally 
trying to be as one-sided in what I said as I possibly could. Because I think the truth, when it comes in a situation of injustice, is always one-sided. And people are always upset with it. Uh, so I, I intended to speak that way. Now, my debates with Charles Long is that we were doing two different things. Charles Long is one of the most sophisticated academics I know. And his understanding of black religion taught me a lot. But I wasn't writing about black religion. I was not writing about that. That's, that's his area. I was not writing about I was writing about I'm a theologian writing about what the hell is the Christian gospel all about. Mm. That's all I was asking. And how does that understanding shape how the church ought to preach its message and live that gospel? That's all I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to give a sophisticated analysis of black religion as Charles Long was doing. And I, you know, and I learned a lot from him. We were just, I was, we were just concerned about different things. Mine was sharply political intended to be so. I wanted to write about the crucified people in my community. I wanted to say a word that they could say, yes, you're right, son. I wanted them to feel empowered by their culture, by their history, by their understanding of the Christian faith. So my work was intended for the Christian community and anybody else who want to listen to us. Now, when it comes to J.D. Otis Robert, we just born at different times. I'm, I'm, on, I'm right between the old civil rights era and the new black power era. I'm right there leaning toward black power. J.D. Otis is the same place, but he's leaning towards civil rights. And that was the tension. There was really no difference. He, he just didn't think I should be so mean in the way I, which I talk to white people. But, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't trying to be mean. <laughs> I was trying to speak the truth as bluntly and as directly as I knew it. And I didn't care who didn't like it. It was not my job to make people feel good about what they had done to black people. It's not mm. my job to do that. Mm. And I'm not going to say it in a way where they like me. That's not my job either. My job is to speak the truth. And remember, the one who's the gospel, you know, I'm trying to understand this gospel from Jesus. He was crucified. Now, you don't want people to crucify you. Are you sure you're talking about the same person? It's hard to preach the gospel and not be offensive. They just don't go together. And that was my only point to J.D. Don't assure nobody of reconciliation if they don't want it. If they wanted it, they know how to get it. So why should I just smile and say, oh, everything is going to be all right? It ain't all right. And I'm here to tell you. And that was the difference between mm. J.D. and my brother and me. Well, <laughs> that's a sibling squad. <laughs> I won't go into that. Family affair. And then here come these powerful feminist critiques, brother, and these Marxist critiques. And you're digging deep in your roots, R-O-O-T-S, but you're taking routes, R-O-U-T-E-S, to every corner of the globe in Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe, but all over. Triple wave patriarchy, how you going to hit it head on? Well, Capitalist you know civilization, how you going to hit it head on? Third world challenges where the majority of fellow human beings, our precious brothers and sisters of all colors, live. And you became the global theologian born in Arkansas. 
Well, I think that I have learned more from my critics than they have learned from me. Hmm. I don't think I would have kept writing if it had not been for Charles Long and the challenge he posed, for J.D. Otis Roberts and the challenge he posed, for William Jones, and William Jones' challenge was a deep challenge to me because I had to wrestle with what is the nature of Christian discourse and how come it has trouble answering what Bill Jones was talking about. So that day, in, my critics kept mm. me wrestling because I had to answer. And then not only in my own community when it started with long, with Preston Williams, my friend out there, with 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 J. D. Otis Roberts, and 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 all the others that came, but also with the Latin American liberation theologians hmm. and their challenge, and also with the feminist theologians yeah. Yeah. and the womanist theologians. I think. I would have stopped writing long ago if it had not been for the challenging critiques of my students at Union, of my colleagues at Union, and all my colleagues around the world telling me what I didn't get right, mm. challenging me to answer how it is that my way of looking at things didn't take this into account. And right now it's the gay and lesbian and, and all of the other ones who are still presenting, presenting that challenge. I tell my students, you should be grateful to your critics. Mm. Be grateful, because if you are the only one talking, you're going to run out of something to say. <laughs> So my critics, they are my best friends as intellectuals because they always are presenting something to me that I have to respond to that is so true and so meaningful that for me to turn away from it is like turning away from the truth. Mm. And it's, I have been fortunate that I've traveled around the world in which people have invited me in India and in China and in Africa and all over Latin America asking me to make sense out of black theology. See, to me, all theology begins in a particular place and time. But it doesn't stay there. It has to reach beyond itself. If it doesn't, it becomes ideology. So you have to press toward the universal. And one of the biggest critics that my uh, black colleagues have said is that I was too universal. Most whites say I'm too particularistic. So, but the blacks always said I was too universal, too reaching out, you know, this gospel. But for me, trying to hold on to both, the particularity that gave birth to me, the universality which the gospel pushes me out for, that's what sent me around the world. That's what made me debate Gustavo Gutierrez, Hugo Osman, Leonardo Buff, and all of the rest, and Rosemary Ruther, and, and Dolores Williams, and, and a whole lot of host of people. All these people, put challenges before me that stretch my intellectual and spiritual imagination. And for them, I am grateful. Mm. One last question before we open it up. We got a good, ooh, look at this crowd you got here, brother. We got a lot of good questions. But of course, I, I couldn't sit here and not say something. I just mentioned Gay Wilmore, yes. James Melvin Washington, yes. James Forbes. Oh, we love those brothers so. Say something about your classic on Martin and Malcolm. What was it that led you back to write that magnificent magisterial text? Because there's a sense in which you entered a 
different kind of discourse there. Am I right about that? Yes, or no? yes, it is. Uh, but let me say a word about that. Yeah. Actually, Hello. Martin and Malcolm was always there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I felt in the 1960s, and I must say a word about him too, because if anybody who had more impact on me than anybody else among the black theological colleagues were Gayward S. Wilmore. Yeah, oh, Brother Wilmore. Yeah, and I, yeah, tonight yeah, I'm going to have a chance to say a word about him mm. at the awards ceremony because there's no one who has been more supportive and more challenging. It was Wilmore's critique uh, of me in terms of my universalism that forced me to keep my feet on the ground in the black community. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm deeply grateful, and James Washington and James Forbes and Cornel West, we four taught at Union Seminary together. Oh, yes, we did. And if you look at Wes's new book, Brother West, yeah, yeah. you will see a picture of us, the four of us, Washington, Cone, West, all of us and Forbes right there together at Union Seminary. That was a great time. So that helped me to grow and, and to, develop, to develop. But the book, Martin and Malcolm and America, you see the black in black theology comes from Malcolm X. Hmm. That's where the militancy comes from. I must say that my style in speaking and trying to say the truth come from Malcolm. Because hmm. Malcolm spoke to my spirit. He spoke to my blackness. He spoke to what white people had made me want to hate and hmm. end up hating myself. It was Malcolm who helped me to make the transition from a Negro theologian to a black theologian. That's Malcolm. So the black and black theology comes from Malcolm X. I didn't, it, it, Malcolm is there at the beginning, but I don't have time to write a reflection on Malcolm. My community is in flames. Hmm. The cities are burning. I can't sit down and write no academic text. I have to write what is on my heart and in my mind of what the truth is. Now, the theology in Martin and Malcolm, uh, in black theology, the theology in black theology comes from Martin King. See, I'm a Christian. I always be that. But I was black before I was Christian. You see, that's why this ain't no theology in black. No, no. I, I, people say, why don't you call it theology in black? No. It's black theology. I'm black before I was a Christian, before I became a theologian. Theology can't trump blackness. So that's got to be at heart. So Martin can't trump Malcolm. As Malcolm starts at the grassroots, but King takes me far beyond my own particularity. He tells me what the world demands of us all, that we are to seek for that beloved community. Yes, yes, yes. That's the heart of the gospel. Yes, yes. That's the heart of what all human beings should be struggling for. And therefore, in modern and in black theology, black power, black theology, liberation, God of the oppressed, spiritual, all of modern and Malcolm are there but I don't have time to write about them then. It's only when I get to the beginning of the 1980s and I talk, sit down and talk with Gayrod Wilmore after we have done the Black Theology, a documentary history, which came out in 1969. 79. 79, That's 1979. Right. That's right. I, after that, I said to Wilmore, what are we going to do now? And that's when the idea that I got to explain these two figures, I got to wrestle with the two figures hmm. 
that had given me voice. Without Martin and Malcolm, I wouldn't have anything to say. To, 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 I wouldn't have any attention that would give birth to the theological discourse that I wanted to write. So I owed it to them. Hmm. It, I, people were splitting them, saying Malcolm is a hater and Mal Martin is a lover. I said, no, you got it all wrong. They both were fighting for the same thing. And I wanted to write that so that the black community could love Malcolm just like they love Martin and have a better understanding of both in the process. Okay, now I'll yeah, like we to open it up. Uh, open it up. Rich, brother. Rich. Open the floor to uh, comments and questions. We have microphones in both aisles. If you will go to those microphones so that everyone can hear the comments and questions. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the ways that you um, have inspired me. I'm Buddhist, and I am deeply inspired by you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I notice that many of the uh, influences that you have mentioned have been men. And uh, Dr. West asked you about patriarchy and so forth. And in passing, you mentioned Rosemary Ruther and Dolores Williams. And I wonder if you'd be willing to say a little more specifically about what you have learned from your feminist and womanist critics and also from your GLBT critics and students. Well, I have learned one thing about my limitations and about the gaps in what I write. I've also learned more about how to be open and more holistic and to realize that theological discourse cannot afford to be exclusive. It has to be inclusive. Now I must say that I don't always write about people in the way they want me to write about them. And I can't always address any issue the way they want me to address it. But one thing for sure, at Union Seminary in my classes, I address all those issues. I teach a class in which each one, I seldom teach a class in which all the issues you mentioned, feminists, womanists, gay, lesbians, transgender, etc., are not a part of it. Uh, whether I do it well or not, I don't know. You have to ask them. But I do try, and all I can tell you, I've done the best I can. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you speak about the cross and the lynching tree? That's the book I'm writing right now, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. I have finished kind of the first draft of that book. And my only concern in that book is to say that the crucifixion of Jesus was a first century lynching. And that particularly if America, United, uh, Christians in the United States, if we want to understand what the crucifixion and the cross was all about. We can only do that by seeing it through the image of lynch black victims in the United States of America. That's just one angle, but it's an indispensable angle. You can't go around that. And it's very interesting that theologians, whether they're New Testament scholars or theologians, systematic theologians, they have not said a word about that. How is it that the New Testament talks about Jesus being nailed to a tree? And here, U.S. citizens and Christians are nailing blocks to trees just like the Romans nailed Jesus? How come 
theologians with all of their imagination did not see that connection. Reinhold Niebuhr, while pastoring in Detroit and nearly had a lynching in Detroit, 1925. And, uh, as a real, and Niebuhr knew about it. In fact, he headed up a, a committee to deal with race in Detroit after that near lynching. But he never wrote about it. He never said a word about it. The, 19, the late 19th century, early 20th century, all the way up to Emmett Till, 1955, lynching was a national crime. And theologians said nothing. Here they are nailing black people and hanging them on trees and burning their bodies and worshiping that Jesus that was nailed to a tree in a similar manner. And they don't say anything. That silence speaks loud to me. And I am angry about that. And I'm going to say something about that in the book that I'm writing right now. <laughs> yes. I thank you so much for representing the truth and representing the Holy Spirit in everything you do. For the most part of the last so many years, we've had a, poly a theology of wealth, a theology of power. As we, and I wish this were not so, descend into perhaps a period of, or experience a period of new poverty, that others who did not know poverty are going to be experiencing poverty. Are we going to be able to see a theology growing out of that, or are we finally going to have an understanding of a theology of what I would call community, that we're all part of one great community and can work towards a new order? I hope the latter. I work for the latter. I do hope we learn how to cross boundaries of class and sexuality and race and cultures and nationality so that human beings become one people. That was Martin King's vision. I think it's out of that vision theology should be written. And I think when we are silent about what is so wrong in our midst, I think that silence speaks louder than we know. And so I, I, I don't know whether we'll make it, and I don't know whether I'll be around to see it, but I certainly hope so. A comment and a question. Uh, when you mentioned that you wrote Malcolm and Martin so the black community could love Malcolm like love Martin, I was thinking about when I was teaching re religious ethics in Cleveland, using your book with your encouragement in a class of religious ethics of Martin King and Malcolm X, and you helped the young black inner city students there love Martin because they said at the beginning of the class, with one exception, it was about half black and half white, this was early 90s, why do we want to learn about Martin King? I hate to say this, but they said this, that Uncle Tom. And I said, Martin King has been sanitized by the white community with King Day. You read this book, you give Martin King a chance. And you help those young students love Martin King like they already loved Malcolm X. So thank you for that. Now my question is, I had heard you say um, at Union that after you went to Asia, you couldn't write Christian theology in the same way. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that. Do I remember correctly that you said that? Yes, I did say that. Yeah, Adrian, Adrian was a special moment in my life. I went to left Garrett and taught for two and a half years, almost three, at Philander Smith College when I left, when I left Garrett and Northwestern University. But um, when I went to Adrian, largely because uh, I was not, uh, my time had run out at Philander, according to the president of Philander at that time. So I, I, I had to find somewhere to go. So Adrian was the place. And Adrian is a city of about 25,000 people and maybe about 25 or 30 black people. And I was the only 
black professional in the city. And being around so many white people, they were nice. But they were you everywhere you look, they were there. And I picture this, in the summer of 1967, Detroit blows up. <laughs> 43 people or so killed. The city burned. And here I am about 60, 70 miles from Detroit in Adrian, Michigan, at Adrian College. There are about 2,000 students there, 1,500 to 2,000, and only about five black students. I'm the only black professor. And as I just walked around, I could hardly keep my sanity. The pain inside, it wasn't anything personal to anybody. I had nice neighbors. They smiled. In fact, the, 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 the neighbor across the street from me babysat my sons. So it, it's, uh, it was a wonderful community by their way of what they could do, but I was hurting. And in my house, I had what was called, what I called the blue room. And that's where I played the blues and jazz all night in order to keep my sanity. So that's where I learned to write theology in a new way. I had to. I had to write it in a new way along the lines of B.B. King and John Lee Hooker. Mm. Or I would crack up. And I started growing an air for and a beard and everybody started looking at me. They said, something is wrong with James Cone. <laughs> you better not say nothing to him. Uh, and I was mad. I was not from nobody in particular. I still smile a little bit. <laughs> but I was angry. That's when I said I had to say something. I actually went back to the University of Chicago and talked to Nathan Scott. I wanted to get a degree in theology and literature, although I already had a PhD in theology. I wanted to do that called Baldwin and Wright and Ellison and, and all the other poets and, and novelists and literary people, they seem to have the language for the right thing. I said, how come I can't write like that? So I wanted to go study with Nathan Scott and study these literary people. But the cities were burning. And I couldn't go back into the halls of academia. I had to take what I had and write theology the best way I could with the resources I had and learn along the way. Mm, mm. Did that question also have to do with Asia? Adrian and Asia. When you went to Asia, when you came back to the States, oh, could yeah, you write Christian theology? Was it about Asia? Both the dialectics working. Okay. It's Adrian <laughs> and Asia. No, to keep that dialectic there, no, keep that thing there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was invited in 1975 by the Korean Christian Church in Japan. When, the, when Koreans in Japan met me at the World Council of Churches in Geneva, they asked me to come to Korea, I mean to Japan, and talk to Koreans. I said, what do I have to say about that? I said, I don't know Korean, don't know Japanese, and never been there before. What possibly could I have to say to Koreans living in Japan? And they told me, you just tell your story. We will make the connection. <laughs> okay, for three weeks. I travel all over Japan talking to Korean Christians, preaching that I must have given over 30 lectures almost daily for three weeks. And I got so empowered. The Korean community is so similar to the black community. They cry a lot, you know. They have passion. 
And when I told my story, and it's a very conservative Korean community, because the fundamentalists are, are, you know, were the missionary. But when I told the story about the spirituals, the blues, and all the cultural resources we used to survive slavery and lynching and segregation, they said, you know what? We wrote songs when the Japanese oppressed us. And we, from about the beginning of the 20th century all the way to the end of World War I, or World War II, we were oppressed by the Japanese. And so they found my way of talking about black theology encouraged them to talk about a sojourner's theology. And then I went on to Seoul, Korea, because I had been invited there by Korean Christians there. And the park regime was in declared mm. military order there. I tell you about 11 o'clock, all the streets, nobody on the streets. I've never been as scared as anywhere in my life as in Korea during that time. That's where I spoke about black theology there, and they made the connection and began to write about Mingjung theology. Mm -hmm. I met Sun Nam Dung, David Saw, and all of those Korean Christian creating Mingjung theology. That's the significance of Asia. I would say Co Koreans were the first, besides the Africa, to, for me to make that international connection. Mm -hmm. Powerful, okay. powerful. Question on this side. Dr. West and Dr. Cohn, uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you both for your work through these years. It's been a great inspiration to me as I've come into my own uh, study of theology. When I was writing my dissertation, a line from the 20th anniversary uh, edition of uh, Black Theology of Liberation was constantly in my mind. And Dr. Cohn, it was the line that says that even 20 years later, these questions are still not being talked about. And for me, that ideo ideological unearthing is an important part of what uh, needs to be done. And I just first of all want to say thank you for that because it's been an inspiration to me as, I, as I've studied theology and continue to teach theology. Thank you. I've been, I've been trained in white seminaries. I, I was privileged to teach for several years in a small black college in, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, American Baptist College. Oh, yes. In yes. both of those contexts, I find that students have a resistance to the tradition and learning the tradition and there is this push to abandon the tradition and just go to the immediate experience. What I find so helpful about Black Theology of Liberation as a teaching tool is your willingness to go through the tradition and unearth the gospel in the tradition even though it had been buried again and again. And my question to you, sir, is that now many years since writing that, do you still find value in going into the tradition? Can I still say to my students, there is value there, or would you advocate a different way of teaching the gospel? No, I think we can learn from a lot of traditions. And the main Western theological tradition is an indispensable source for me, and I think for anybody living in the Western world that's Christian. That's why I teach a course right now on Reinhold Niebuhr. If I didn't think that tradition was important, I'm critical of it, but I think it's indispensable for anyone that wants to dialogue in theology across the globe today because that's the tradition that brought us to the point where we are. How are you going to change something and you don't understand it? It is indispensable. I always want to know who my enemies are. I want to know how they think. I want to know what they leave out and why they leave it out. I want to know why I'm not present there. So for me to have written a dissertation on Carl Bart and read all of those dogmatics, my God, from Zion, if you make it through there, you, you are ready to fight anybody. <laughs> so I'm glad I studied Bard. I studied Niebuhr, Tillich, Bonhoeffer, Bootman, Harnack, Slymarker, Calvin, Luther, all of them make me. 
And that's why I think I have an advantage in a debate with any white theologian because I know them better than they know me. See, I got an advantage there. See, I can dialogue on their turf. I remember once I, Schubert Ogden wanted to dialogue with me at Perkins. I said, okay, let's talk about King and Bootman. No, he didn't want to talk about King. He was ready to talk about Bootman all day long. <laughs> you follow what I mean? He wanted me to come over there. I said, oh, no, you got to come to my place, too. <laughs> Ah, and I debate any white theologian any day as long as they come to my place and talk to me about David Walker, about Henry Holland Gannett, and all, and about, you know, Ida B. Wells Barnett, you name it. I'm ready to talk. But I ain't just going to talk about your thing as though that's the only thing in the world. No. And if I get in that debate, I'm going to pull it. And I'm going to show you cannot be a real holistic person until you move outside hmm. of your particularity. So moving and studying Western theology, I love it. That's why in my foundations in Christian theology at Union, I have, you know, I begin with Barton, Tillich, Bonhoeffer, all of them. But I also get to black theology. I get to feminist theology. I get to Asian theology. I get to African theology. I get to gay theology. I get all of them. Because you got to stretch outside of your particular. So I encourage any student, study Western theology now. That's your enemy. That's the people who have left you out of the discourse. And you ask your professor, why are we not in that discourse? That's all I want to know. Am I not a human being? Didn't I make some kind of contribution to something? How come I'm not here? How come Niebuhr lives so close to Harlem and you read him and you wouldn't know it? I think that's a real issue for me. And I wish he was around so I could ask him. <laughs> but well, okay. we should say that Reinhold Niebuhr was very glad when you first came to Union. Is yeah, he right? was. Yeah, yeah. You see, so he's Niebuhr, open to Niebuhr, the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. He's open to the dialogue. Well, he was in his last years then. Uh, Sometimes when uh, you get old, you have more clarity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. He wrote, he wrote, he wrote to John Bennett a letter which John Bennett showed to me, how pleased he was that I had come to Union Theological Seminary. And I was so deeply grateful for that, but I didn't care whether he was pleased or not. Uh, <laughs> I really didn't, but I, I am now, I am now, I am now, I am now. But you have to understand where the fire is. And you just, I just don't want to put the fire out until we save the house. Okay, uh, one last question since we're out of time. Sure, well, I have a, I have a question for both Drs. Cohn and West. Um, and it's a little bit political, so I hope you're comfortable with that. Um, but um, there's this idea that... Here, here is the political one. Right? <laughs> um, there's this idea that's been sort of popularized in the American media since the election of Barack Obama of, this, of America as this post-racial society, um, that the work is kind of somehow done. Um, and I was wondering if, if both of you would maybe respond to that. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to say a word? You go ahead. Yeah, I've been talking. No, you talk. no, no I, this, I, I, this has just been so rich. But I think our dear sister... I want to say that anytime you have two Jesus-loving free black men on the stage, you can ask any kind of question you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. But uh, uh, no, post-racialism uh, is a lie. It's just a lie. That uh, when you have white brothers and sisters in Iowa and other places voting for a candidate based on qualification rather than pigmentation, that's not post-racial, they're just less racist. 
than their parents and grandparents. That's a beautiful thing, but you don't give out moral prizes for being less racist. <laughs> but it's progress, you know what I mean? But, but Malcolm used to say, well, you don't stab a man in the back nine inches, pull it out six inches, and celebrate progress only. So in that sense, it's a breakthrough, but we still have so much work to do. And when you break the glass ceiling at the top, you still got so many brothers and sisters in the basement. And it's the basement that you need to focus on in terms of the progress, which is undeniable and indisputable. There would be no Barack Obama without James Cone's work, without Martin King, without Malcolm, without Fannie Lou Hamer. Without Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hesher, without Philip Berrigan, without Dorothy Day, we can go on and on and on. It's that movement that created a context so that you can lessen the racist perception and practice so that a significant number of white brothers and sisters in America would be willing to vote for a brilliant, charismatic candidate who was running against a mediocre and dull candidate. <laughs> What can I say behind that? <laughs> no, I, 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 let me just say, I'm concerned about the people in the basement. And uh, you cannot have a post-racial society if, if of the two million or more people in prisons, nearly half are African American. That's not post-racial. There are more blacks in prisons and jails today than it was in 1950. During the heart of segregation and lynching, there are more percentage-wise in jails and in prisons and being executed than it was in the 1930s or 40s or 50s. So that doesn't sound like post-racial to me. That sounds like they've learned how to cover it up yeah, yeah. and not as much overt, but a deep covert racism. So I would say we're not post, we're right in the midst of it. Okay, thank you.